<laughs> Hi everyone and welcome to the OMS. My name's James. I'm head of programs here at Insight Outreach and I'm also joined today by a couple of our fellow board members and mentors in the chat. I have Jemima here who leads our various social media so do watch out for some of the answers that she might be able to post to your questions as well in the chat. The first thing I would recommend is if you haven't done it already, do follow us on our social media channels. So this YouTube channel and also on the Instagram, they're really good ways to keep up to date with the latest stuff going on. Today is a session primarily for you to ask any questions you have about Oxbridge, about the Oxbridge mentoring scheme, the OMS that we run here at Insight Outreach, and then really just get, get started on that process. So just before we do that, and do begin asking your questions in the chat as you feel free, if you are watching this live on our website portal, the way you can see that live chat, if you can't see it now, is just by clicking the title of the webinar. So if you click that bit that says OMS introduction, mentees, click that exact part at the top, it should take you to the YouTube platform where you should see a chat bar on the right hand side and you can write anything you want at the bottom there and we'll begin answering it for you. Some of you might know a little bit more about the OMS to start with than others. So let me catch everyone up to speed on what it is, how it works and how it's structured. The first thing to know is that this is a nine month program. So it will start this month in March and then run through to hopefully the point of an Oxbridge interview that you might have in December. Each of you on this scheme has been paired with a mentor and you've done really, really well to get a full place on our scheme. The applications were quite competitive this year, but all of you have sailed through that application process with flying colors. So really well done, and we hope you're excited to meet your mentors, which will be beginning very shortly. So that's a little bit about the process. I'm happy to talk about it in a bit more detail, but I know you've all been given booklets and everything like that already, so I don't want to go into too much of it for now. So really over to you guys to start asking your questions via the chat. You can ask about the OMS, you can ask about Oxbridge in general, any worries or any things you're looking forward to, and then we'll go from there. So I'll give you a couple of moments to think of any questions you might want to ask and then put them when they're ready. How do we get in touch with our mentors, says Alwyn. Thanks, Alwyn, great first question. So your mentors will actually be the ones to get in touch with you. They're all ready to go, they've been lined up, they're excited to meet you. We're just waiting on the final couple of people to accept their offers. I know we put the deadline for that as Friday, but we're chasing a couple of people where it's been blocked by school email addresses and so on. So once those final people have confirmed, your mentors will be in touch via the same email we emailed you guys with to introduce themselves, to introduce a little bit about their Oxbridge journey and so on. So it will be very shortly next week, Alan. Just while we wait for a couple of other questions to come in, let me let me talk a little bit about the mentors. Sam, no, you didn't miss anything important in the first 45 seconds. That was just me welcoming, saying how well you'd all done. How many books should one read for computer science and math, says Ifaz. Great question. I would say for computer science and maths, we would say about at least one bit of extra reading per month would be great and we have some advice on what that can be on our reading lists. But the most important thing for things like maths and computer science is you're doing problems, you're doing practical steps. And there are some great websites that you can look at in the back of your mentee booklet that will provide some details on where you can go there. So try some of these practice problems, try some of these options that they recommend in your booklets, and that can be a great way to just stretch your knowledge a bit further. The main way those questions work is they'll take concepts that you're quite familiar with or hopefully will be familiar with by the end of your A-level studies and then get you to apply them in slightly new ways in scenarios that you might not have considered too much before. Quinn says, what will be the size of our mentee groups? Great question. So some of you 
will be in a one-to-one -one group in a small a small amount of you will have that the majority of you will be in groups of two or three and in very few cases there might be a group of four this is deliberate on our part with with, with the reason why we want to assign you in small groups is because we really like building a sense of community here at rms so we don't want you to be doing this process alone maybe you're someone at your school who's always one of the top achievers and other students like oh not them again not them the one always working we are going to pair you with other students around the country who are just as passionate about your subject as you are. The groups, we try and match exactly by subject. So you'll be with other people who are just as passionate about the same course as you are so that you can drive each other on, share your own ideas and advice and do work together. So I said earlier about reading one book per month. Maybe if one of you reads one book per month and makes some summary notes and another of you read another book per month and make some summary notes, you can swap notes and suddenly you're both read two books per month. So that's another reason why we pair you in small groups. It can help drive stuff forward. So Vegas says, how will we access the books for the reading list if our local libraries are closed? Excellent question. And what I can say is we've tried as much as possible to put resources that are available online on our reading list as well. So if you can't get to a library, or you can't find anywhere to get it, or you can't get the book in another way, there might be an online copy for lots of our resources. And the other thing I would say there is, when you meet your mentor, your mentors are lovely people who often have copies of these books themselves, and you are allowed to ask them to post it to you. That has been something that's happened in the past, or we would ask there, of course, is please return it to them when you're finished with it. So, Hamza says about your GPA score and the effect on Oxbridge. What I would say there is it, it kind of the grade requirements for Oxbridge, we're not going to lie. Of course, they're going to be above some other universities. But the main thing I would say is it's been a crazy last 12 months. I'm sure you've all experienced with school. So this year, I can't actually say too much about how they're going to interpret GCSE grades, A-level grades, whether they're going to be more lenient based on the year or whether they're going to be the same as they usually are in terms of the strictness with it. What I would say is that I think that they will place slightly more emphasis on their admissions tests in November. So if you haven't heard about these yet, Oxford and Cambridge run their own admissions process where you'll be asked to take a test for most subjects to assess your aptitude and your potential in that subject and I think those will be quite an important part of the process this year given how unpredictable the education scenarios have been for most schools. Great just having a look at some of the others so Antonio says will there be any resources and help available for entrance exams for example economics at Cambridge? Short answer to that, Antonio, is yes, definitely. We will be able to give you help with all of the entrance exams and we'll be able to give you both advice on kind of the specific types of questions so you can help prepare there. The main thing I would say on that is uh, some people say that you, you can't really prepare for these tests. Um, I disagree with that, to be honest. You can definitely prepare for these tests and the more practice you do, the better you'll get at them. Because after you've done about four or five past papers, even if the exact questions they ask can sometimes surprise you, there won't be any surprises with the type of question. So let me give you an example from the TSA and the BMAT. They ask about something called a syllogism. If you've never heard of what a syllogism is before, don't worry. I certainly hadn't when I was first preparing that kind of stuff. But after you've spotted it a couple of times, it becomes easy to spot. And then suddenly you're familiar with that format of question and it won't surprise you if it comes up on the day. So we will prepare with prepare for all of the kind of things there. And we'll also give you some admissions tests advice. So advice that will help you to kind of think about the structure of any test. For example, in a multiple choice test, how long should you be spending reading the questions versus reading the passage? And maybe you should try and eliminate wrong answers before you try and actually spot the right one. What do I mean by that? Well, let's say you're given five options to pick between for multiple choice and you have four minutes left of your exam. Maybe you can't exactly find the right answer, but if you can rule out three of them, 
then suddenly you've got a 50% chance of guessing right and you can kind of get through the last couple just before the time runs out. So we'll help you with stuff like that as well. Uh, the admissions tests are definitely something that we prepare for in quite a lot of detail slightly later in the year. Tizia, I can see you've read our mentee booklet, so thank you so much for that. Talking about the future leader sessions, allow me to explain a little bit about what they are. So each month, your RMS process is made up of kind of three key things. The first thing is your monthly mentoring session with your wonderful personal mentors who you'll be meeting very soon. The second thing is a webinar, such as what we're doing now. Some of them will also be on Zoom and we'll have multiple people. So don't worry, you're not just listening to me every month. Far from it. So that's the second part, the webinar. And then the third part is the FLS. That's called a Future Leaders Session. This runs for most groups, unless you're in a subject where we don't have an exact person to pair you with. And in those future leader sessions, you'll meet up with the other students who are passionate about your subject without any mentors present. And you can discuss anything you like in those sessions. So it could be that you're both working on the same A-level topics and you want to help each other revise or drive them forward. It could be that a really interesting article in the news has come up recently and you want to discuss that. It could be that you simply found the last OMS session slightly difficult or there was a bit you didn't get and you were scared to ask your mentor and you want to go through it together in more detail or your mentor set you something to do and you want to work on it together. So those are all the kinds of things you can do in a future leader session. We don't mind how it runs. It can be on any video platform you choose to speak to your other mentee. So you can, we've had people using Discord, we've had them using WhatsApp video, however you like that session to run, you can do it there and you can also do it in whatever time suits everyone in your group. Each month, we ask one person to lead that, and that just means it's your job to organize that session for the other mentees in your group, and also suggest a rough kind of content and structure for the session. So will you be discussing that new story or the homework or something like that? Will we go through how to do personal statements and interviews, says Marie? Yes, definitely. So personal statements, we have a tried and tested model that we've been using, in fact, since 2006. And we also have logs for pretty much every subject, I think, of past personal statements of students that have succeeded in getting into Oxbridge. And we'll share them with you over the summer. So we'll give you that, and then we'll teach you our unique six paragraph structure for a personal statement. And we'll encourage you to plan and use that structure to write a standout personal statement. Interviews, yes, we definitely prepare for them as well. In lots of ways, the best preparation for interviews is that monthly mentoring session with your mentor, because in those, we try and kind of loosely recreate the supervision, if you're at Cambridge, or tutorial, if you're at Oxbridge, uh, if you're Oxford, system that they use in those sessions. So that will prepare you for thinking like you might need to at the interview, in a much more friendly laid back way. Don't worry, it's not like a test every month, far from it. Like the, the mentoring sessions are laid back. They're one of the most enjoyable parts of the process, I think. Um, so that's some preparation you'll do for interviews every month. And then also, as it gets slightly later in the year, around November, we start ramping up that preparation a little bit more. So you'll be given a uh, invite to a workshop where we'll have a day to prepare you fully around interviews that has guest speakers. Last year, our guest speaker for that workshop was an admissions tutor at Cambridge. So again, they'll be able to give you plenty of insights. We have people from both sides of the process. So those people who have run the interviews and people who have taken the interviews themselves, both sharing their advice on what can help you to stand out. So hopefully that answers your question, Marie, and there will be lots more on that from your mentors. Are articles related to our course just as valid as reading books? Yes, definitely. One thing I want to emphasize here is you don't just have to be a reader to get into Oxbridge. Some of you might love reading. Great. I loved reading when I was preparing. It was fantastic. It was great to do. I enjoyed extending my knowledge beyond the main course I was doing. But you don't have to be. If you prefer watching YouTube, if you prefer listening to podcasts, if you prefer watching things on Netflix, those are all completely valid ways to prepare. I know that some people go into their interviews and they've much preferred doing like online problems and 
for computer science. There's some people who are even talking about the games they've been playing and the technology that works behind that. So you don't just have to read. You can use any articles, any other kind of resource to help prepare you as well. Kamal Preet, um, if you scroll back to the start of this webinar afterwards, I've covered a little bit on when you'll be introduced to your mentors, so do look there. Fantastic. Safwan Ali says, what is OMS's success rate in terms of how many people get accepted into Oxbridge per 90 students a year? Great question. Allow me to give you some, some slightly different figures and then explain how each of them works. So. The short answer to that is 40%. 40% of our candidates on average across our years have achieved an Oxbridge offer from application through to right through to, to getting their final offer. So we like that statistic. We think it's pretty high. We hope you're excited by that statistic too. I'm now going to give you another statistic and that's to say our interview success rate. So our Oxbridge interview success rate, which was 49% in 2018, 53% in 2019, and I wish I could provide you the final one for last year. We have to chase up a couple more people, but it looks to be around 50% again. What do I mean by interview success rate? Well, I think one of the things that's quite unique about OMS and it's important to mention is that we're not just going to kind of shove you towards Oxbridge right now and say, this is the only place that you should be preparing for and the only place you should go. No, we're going to help you prepare for all of your university options. And... It might be that in that preparation, you find a course that's fantastic at UCL or at Durham or another university that you didn't realize you could cover as much. And we're going to look at with you and see if Oxbridge is actually the best fit for what you want to study and whether it's the right university for you. So that's why we say our interview success rate because not everyone on OMS will end up applying and potentially not everyone should. And we'll work with you for that process. Don't panic about it. If you want to apply, we are, of course, going to let you apply. We're going to help you apply and go the full way for that. But that's why I prefer using our interview success rate, because it tells us a little bit more about how far through that process we get. The other thing I want to say there is that success rate, well, I think it's very high. I hope you agree. But in a large part, that's also down to your work rather than just those of mentors. And, and I want to explain a little bit more about this in that I want you to kind of imagine your mentor a bit like a Sherpa, like the, the people who help people get up mountains in, in that essentially we know that that Sherpa can go up and down the mountain. We know that they can plot a route, they've found the route before and they're an expert at doing that. So, it's great having that mentor there. They're there to assist, but they can't drag you up that mountain. The work, the preparation, that dedication to going up there has to be primarily driven by you. Of course, they can do some of the lifting along the way. Of course, they can kind of help you find the right route and things like that. But fundamentally, this is a process that has to come from you. Your mentor is there to help rather than to just be the kind of thing that's going to make sure that you get in. This process has to be driven by you and they are the skills that will be teaching you. And I think that is the key behind our success rate is that it relies on all of your hard work, which we know year on year that all of you are completely prepared and ready to do. So I think that's the key to our success rate. If you're looking for kind of, we're going to tell you month by month, this is the way you get into Oxbridge. And if you do this, you'll get in. If anyone tells you that, I'm sorry, it doesn't exist. It has to come from you guys. And I hope that makes sense. So I went off quite long now. I'm just finding where the next question is for us. Fantastic. So Sanya says, will there be help in choosing whether you want to study at Oxford or Cambridge? Yes, we'll definitely be able to help with that. What I would say, first of all, is do go to the website and compare kind of relative courses that you might want to study. So to give you an example, the law course at Cambridge is called law. The law course at Oxford is called jurisprudence. And there are some differences between what you cover there. The classics course at Cambridge is three years long. The classics course at Oxford is four years long. So do take a look at the two universities and compare and see some of the differences. Your mentor will be there 
to help with that as well. And you can kind of weigh up which one might be better suited to you if you're unsure and will help you to make that decision. Will we get advice on student finance, says Lily? Yes, this is something that we do on a case by case basis. So ask your mentors, um, of course, in terms of helping with that. And we will be able to provide some links as well to help with the student finance sections. But yes, you'll definitely get advice on that and on things like bursaries, scholarships and so on. So there's kind of two type, two main types of student finance. The first is the one that's run with kind of student loans by the national government. And that's done based on your household income and things like that in terms of how much of a loan you can get. Then the second one is run specifically by Cambridge and Oxford. And one of the greatest things about these universities is they're very rich. So they do offer out lots of great bursaries. For example, there are some bursaries at Cambridge where you can get £3,500 towards that fee per year just to start with by meeting criteria. All you have to do is apply and that money can pretty much be yours. So there are some great options there that can help with student finance that are also specific to Oxford and Cambridge. They want the best people for their courses alone. It's as simple as that. So if you've got worries about student finance, we will definitely help you solve them and so will Oxbridge. Does Oxbridge ever allow, or does Oxford ever allow, it says students to defer a year? They require a foundation course in art before you apply, but I'm applying this October. Um, so that's a good question. For art specifically, um, I think they sometimes recommend that you take the foundation course first. Oxford can allow, generally, Oxford can allow people to defer a year, but it kind of varies on what course and the exact nature of that. In particular, the ones that I would also strongly encourage you to consider are if you're studying a language, for example, and you're going to defer a year, take a year out, they probably want to see some evidence that you're doing something related to that language in the year out so that your kind of skill in using that language doesn't drop off massively in your time away. So, of course, if you want to take a year out of your language and you want to go to that country, if that's even going to be possible in sometime soon, hopefully in the future, then, then yes, that would be far more okay. But do think about if you want to take a year out, what are you going to do that's relevant to your subject, that's going to show them that you're doing that to, to further yourself and be even more competitive as an applicant rather than just because you want to go off and travel around the world. Marie says, will we help you to apply to other top universities other than Oxbridge? Yes, definitely. So this is an Oxbridge specific program and they are our focus, but all of the skills we teach you will be directly useful to your other universities. And we definitely also cover them, advice on how to pick your other four UCAS options and how that goes along. If you don't know already, I say the other four because you can only apply to one of Oxford or Cambridge. You can't apply to both. So presuming you go ahead with an application there, that'll be one and we'll pick another four or help you to pick those other four with a list of criteria. There are some virtual open days that you can go on as well. I'm just going to have a sip of water, but do keep the questions coming in. Antonia says, when do you think it's appropriate to have fully decided on a course? So you don't need to have decided this month or next month. That would be the first thing I say, but it is pretty much the first thing to consider in this process. The reason why is because once you have narrowed down on that course, you can begin preparing for it specifically rather than too generally. So what we mean by that is, is if you're considering, for example, law and English, and you're completely torn between the two, that preparation reading that you might want to do is going to look very different for those two subjects. So we want to start that with you as early as possible so that we can get in the most amount of preparation. So I would say it is probably one of the top priorities, picking which is the appropriate course and to start preparing for that. But there isn't a rush. You can take a couple of months and you can definitely change your mind. We won't hold you to it until we start getting towards that summer period and you begin writing your personal statement. We will ask and check in along various stages of the process to, to see if you've changed your mind on a course, to see if speaking to a mentor has changed your mind and so on. OK, 
Cool. Freya says, will we get advice on how best to revise for A-levels in order to get the grades we need? Yes, Freya. So in your mentoring sessions, there will be advice on kind of how to maximize your scores in the A-levels and so on. Again, I would say it's not the focus of the process. So kind of we're not going to teach you the A-level course. But if there are topics that you're struggling with or topics that you're particularly weak on, they're the ones that you can mention to your mentor and say, I really don't get this topic. Can you help me with it? And our mentors, to the best of their ability, will help you with those topics. And that will have uh, hopefully an, a positive influence on the grades that you can achieve in those A-level subjects. Will we have advice and more information surrounding the natural sciences tripos at Cambridge? Yes, definitely. And I'm hoping that Jemima somewhere in the chat will reply to this because I know that she studied natural sciences at Cambridge. So I'll probably leave that one to her, Katie, to watch out for an answer there. Brilliant. Can you ask to do a dual course with perhaps another language? Yes, you can do multiple language courses. At Cambridge, this is called an MML degree, so a modern and medieval languages degree. And something that you do at Cambridge is you pretty much study two languages. So you can do two languages that you're already studying, or you can do one language that you already study, and another one called an ab initio language, which is the Latin meaning at the start. So you kind of go in, you've never studied it before, and they build up your knowledge to do that other language. So you can do a dual language course. Um, if by that, Marie, you mean a slightly different thing, having another look at your question, you mean, can you do a course that's like delivered partly in German and partly in English? No, all of the courses at Oxford and Cambridge are pretty much fully delivered in English as kind of the language in which things are written. But of course, those MML, you could have lectures that are in foreign languages and things like that. There are also some pretty cool and pretty unique courses at Oxford that you might not have heard about. So again, I'm going to go back to law as an example. I didn't actually do law, but I, it seems popular in the one I'm picking today. You can do things like law and European law, law and Spanish law and things like that. And they will give you specific insights into um, particular areas as well. So those are courses that can kind of be a bit more country focused as well. Tasia says, are reading lists individualized to your own interests? Sort of. Um, so at the start, we're going to give you a general reading list. We're aware that kind of there can be a thousand and one books that you could read. So at the start, we like to give you quite a general one that will give you things that introduce you broadly to all of the main topics that might be covered in your degree. So you can get an introduction, you can read pretty broadly and then find the areas of interest that appeal to you. We also have some recommended books there to start with um, right at the top of our list and so on. So that bit definitely isn't individualized and it's probably where I'd recommend starting, to be honest. But after that, don't just carry on reading general books that are on that reading list or feel like you need to stick to our reading list. And if you read all of the books on there, you're, you're going to do great. Use it as like a starting point to expand from. So if you've read one book and your favorite chapter was on chapter four about the Sino-Japanese War, for example, in history, then go away and you can definitely find another book that's not on our reading list it's about the Sino-Japanese War and read all about that and then read a historiographical book about about that. And again, so kind of using it as a starting point from which to branch out based on what your favorite topics are. Your mentors will also be able to help with that. So it's not a journey you have to do alone. If you start with a particular book and you love it, ask your mentor if they know similar books or books with a related topic and they'll be able to help there. Ali says, do you only prepare us for Oxbridge entrance exams or other ex entrance exams too, like UCAT and BMAT? So I can say there that the things like BMAT, for example, Oxford takes the BMAT for its medics and applicants. So we will definitely um, be able to prepare you for things like that. So the general exams that are kind of run by quite a lot, things like BMAT and LNAT, yes, we will prepare you for them as well. If you've got a particular one in mind, um, then do let me know about that. But yeah, things like BMAT, definitely we cover and prepare for. And UCAT as well. Why were 
past OMS un meant he's unsuccessful. Could you pinpoint any reasons why? Hamza, this is a great question and, and actually quite a difficult question in some ways. I'll give you my best shot in terms of the, the differences that we've seen between some mentees and others each year in terms of what's the ideal mentee we're looking for. The first thing I would say is mentees who kind of don't start things now, the ones who are always like, oh, I can put that back slightly later because I'm quite busy now and I might have more time next week. Please start now. Whatever it is, get cracking because it's the only way you can drive it forward. If you're having a really busy week, it's absolutely fine to go, right, I, I said I was going to do an hour of reading at this particular point, but I simply don't have time. But still try and maybe fit in half an hour. Don't just kind of sack it off completely or something like that. Another reason I think that, that sometimes mentees can be parts, part unsuccessful is they start with the best intentions in the world. They're kind of very intense at the start. And then it gets kind of through to the summer and things get a bit busier, revision for exams start, and they kind of become a bit more reliant on their mentor. So it kind of becomes a bit like that, that Sherpa analogy I was making earlier. It becomes a bit more kind of my mentor will help carry me through this and so on, rather than that process starts with you. I think it's got to start with you and your motivation there. So that are hopefully, or those are hopefully things that will will help in terms of getting you through to the past kind of the new casting and through to the admissions tests and so on. The main reason that I think people fall down in the admissions tests is to put it simply, if you panic, it's really easy to do this and we will try our best to prepare you not to panic. What I would say there is the best thing you can do for those admission tests is practice. So you're familiar with the types of questions. And if you get stuck in the actual thing, move on, do what you can do and come back to it, especially if it's something like a multiple choice question. I think one of the worst things you can do in those admissions tests is panic on like the first question, spend three times as long as it, and you've suddenly had to rush like four or five other questions just to get back on that timing. So that's the admissions test where I think sometimes people can, can fall down slightly as well. And then the interview. I want to mention two things in the interview that I think are really important in why people struggle at that stage. The first one is, is a test of your potential, not what you already know. One of the things I think interviewers and my supervisor at Cambridge University said is they hate people who go, oh, of course, I knew that already in kind of answer to loads of questions where they didn't get the answer straight away. Don't be afraid of what you don't know. The whole point of that interview is to maybe stretch you beyond ways that you've begun to think about things at school. So it will take a topic and give you an entirely new approach of that. Please try and enjoy that process and don't pretend you knew it all already. It won't do you any favours there. They're not just looking for the most knowledgeable candidates. The most important skill they're looking for is teachability. If you get a place at these colleges, that person in the interview room is going to be sitting down with you, at, in most cases, probably once a week or more to teach you in a very small group. So they want someone that they enjoy teaching and that's going to listen to them and enhance and improve and consider things from different ways from the information they say. So that teachability is a really important thing to, to show in your interview far more than what exact knowledge you might know or already know. And so that's the other thing I think where sometimes people can be unsuccessful. If they go in thinking they're really confident they have all of this knowledge, you might be interested to know that most of our mentors think their interview went pretty badly at some stages. So you don't have to be perfect in that interview. And the people who think it was perfect are probably trying to kind of keep on guiding the questions back to their comfort zones. The ones who are just prepared to think about that question a little bit more and grapple with an unfamiliar concept, they're the ones who, again, have the most chances of success. So hopefully that gives you some idea about the various stages, Hamza, where people can fall down in this process. And hopefully these are things that all of you guys can think about and try and avoid as much as possible as well. One of the documents you'll be getting slightly later in the year is something called our eight traits document. And we asked all of our mentors, all of our past mentees, what things do you think unite all Oxbridge students? And we've created like a tick list of the character traits, whether that be like leadership, critical thinking and so on, of behaviours that show you're doing those things that 
our past successful Oxbridge students have done. Then we also have the ineffective behaviours, things you should definitely avoid trying to do. So that document will also help Hamza if you kind of want to check in on your own progress on how you're performing against these criteria as well. Maria, can you do PPE with another language? In short, to that one, no. Um, sorry, just Oxbridge isn't the right place for that. There might be other university courses where you could do that. I, I can't think of one off the top of my head, um, but I, I wouldn't rule it out completely. But PPE is mainly um, just grouped around yeah, politics, philosophy and economics. If there is another course that kind of comes a bit similar, which is called PPL and that L is for linguistics. So that could be an option if if you're thinking about something slightly different. PPL is an Oxford specific course. Olivia, hi Olivia, says, if I read around research my EPQ topic that is related to my university subject, can I include that in my OMS learning log? Yes, definitely, please do. The learning log is kind of, is a, is a really important document. Just please put everything you read in there. I know it can seem really boring now and not just read all the other activities I mentioned earlier. Please put it all in that document. The reason why I say that is because when you get to writing your personal statement, when it gets to preparing for that interview, all of the things you've done there can then refresh your memory really quickly, rather than getting to kind of November and struggling to remember all these books that you might have read in March or April, or even before you started this process. That just gives you a really concise, clear summary of what you've read and what you can include in all of these things. So do put all of your EPQ reading and research in there, and maybe even make a page for your EPQ itself. One of the most so Oxford and Cambridge can require submitted work, which is work you send in in advance that they might discuss an interview, they might not, but it kind of gives them a feel for how you write things. If you send in part of your EPQ, the most common question actually that I feel is asked on it is what would you do differently if you could do it again? And our OMS helps prepare you for kind of questions like that with the learning log so that you're not just thinking, oh, I have to recall all of these facts I remember. They're thinking, something can always be improved. How would you improve it? How would you go back and reflect on that? So the learning log for the EPQ definitely helps. So I'm loving I'm loving the chat going on there, Safwan and Hamza, great, great stuff. Um, Lily says, if your subject does not require an admissions test, do we still have to you do the section of OMS surrounding this? So the sessions will be specific. If you don't have to do an admissions test, no, you don't have to attend the exact webinar on admissions tests and your mentor will probably not cover them in quite so much detail and that will kind of depend on the syllabus. So things will definitely be tweaked on individual circumstances. We're not gonna prepare you for something that's not gonna be part of your process. Um, what I would say is sometimes it can still be useful to attend things like the admissions test webinar though even if you don't have an admissions test, because it might help with things like A-levels. So if you're doing a multiple choice paper at A-levels, some of the general strategies we give there might be applicable for you. So you can always log into that webinar still, have it on in the background to pick up some general exam tips and be doing something else at the same time. That's absolutely fine. Jemima says, I thought my interview went terribly. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, no, I think, I think, exactly the same as as gem actually i thought one of my interviews actually went okay so i i studied classics uh, at cambridge and i thought one of my interviews went okay and one of my interviews i just i know that this first sentence i've been asked to do kind of a bit of a test before and i just knew i got the first sentence completely wrong i just didn't know where to start with it and i know that definitely went really badly but because it was at the start i think it kind of throws you right at the beginning but the important thing was, I, I don't know, maybe it was a bit of luck, maybe it was kind of, I'd, I'd had a couple of preparation ones, things like that. But it was the fact that I was like, it's just the first bit, like once I've got through that, I might get something a bit more confident. And I did, like, I didn't think the rest went quite as badly as that first sentence, but like, definitely, like there are bits that you can think go terribly. And it's, it's actually like quite a common story. I would definitely say, um, ask your mentors how they think their interviews went and and see if they think parts went terribly. It's absolutely fine if it did. The main thing is don't overthink it. It's quite easy to, to say that they will do because as we say, they're stretching you to think in new ways, a way 
that you won't have thought before. If you carry on getting answers right, they'll stretch you further and further and further until you've reached that point in the interview. And then that's like the key point. How do you react when you now just simply don't know how to approach something? How do you think about it? What what do you go to as your as your option? Will the OMS push us to find work experience or is it less important this year due to COVID? Ali, I'm gonna go out on a limb and guess you're a medic based on the BMAC question and then this question. Um, it varies for some subjects. Medicine's quite a specific one. We will try and help you to find work experience. I think work experience is an important part of the process for medicine and something that we should we should all be looking to build up if you're doing a, a degree like medicine or a vocational degree. Um, I would say that they are more understanding this year because of COVID. So that work experience might look slightly different to usual. It might not be, for example, that you're going to be there working or shadowing someone in a hospital or something like that. But there are other ways you can get involved. Maybe you could volunteer with St. John's Ambulance. Maybe you could go and offer to see if a local centre needs any help with distributing vaccines or something like that. All you can do is ask people for various opportunities as they come up and ask your mentor to help you with that as well. I know some of our mentors for medicine are, are still undergrads, but some are also graduates working full time in the NHS and they might have ideas and ways that can help you to get involved in medicine in that way. So we'll be able to help you with that. And I'm not gonna to say too much more on it now because I'm not a medic. But we have lots of medics who are our mentors and they'll be in touch with far more specific advice than I can give you there. Poppy says, will the interview start with questions about the things we know? It could do, it could not do, would be my answer, Poppy. I think quite often there are there are like some easier questions at the start, which would be questions like, why do you want to study this subject? Why do you want to apply to Oxbridge? Or I've read this in your personal statement. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you would what you mean by this or, or what you're talking about in this topic? Those are questions that hopefully should be slightly easier because we'll help you prepare them. They're things you've written about and thought about in advance. And they could also just throw you in at the deep end as well. I know I know one PPE interview that started this year with how do you know you're living in a democracy if you can't go outside your home due to the new lockdown rules? So that was kind of throwing someone quite in at the deep end. And if they do do that, don't panic. Don't feel like you need to reply in like four seconds. You can take a couple of moments to think about it and then start there. And it's about how you think and how you approach that topic as well. So hopefully that helps it kind of they could do either poppy. Hopefully they'll be nice and kind of ease you in. Not all of them do. Some universities, if you apply to summer schools, give you a reduced offer, e.g. Bath or Bristol. Is that the same for Oxbridge? I'm so glad you mentioned this, Hansa, actually, because I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, summer schools and, and things like that. Um, it's not the same for Oxbridge. So there's not going to be a reduced offer based on if you attend this course or this course, unfortunately. That's purely based. They do offer kind of different offers to some people. That's more based on kind of the circumstances, if you have any extenuating circumstances or based on, on your schooling. So for example, if you come from a school that, that the report might say requires improvement or that you don't have kind of a history of getting lots of people into Oxbridge, they might reflect that in the offer. Um, but I wanna mention something on summer schools. At the OMS, we are gonna prepare you fully for each part of the process from March through to December. But we're also not the only access scheme that exists out here. There are two fantastic summer schools that are completely free that you can apply to that are run by the Sutton Trust and Unique. The applications close on the 15th of March. So if you do want to go to a summer school, we aren't going to be able to take you up to Oxford and Cambridge. I don't know if they are this year based on the pandemic, but... I would say those are your best shots of having someone who can take you up to Oxford and Cambridge and kind of work with you there if that's something that's important to you. So I would recommend applying to Unique. I would recommend applying to the Southern Trust Summer Schools if you are interested in things like that. But do so like straight after this pretty much because those applications close very, very shortly. It's actually one of the reasons why we were so keen to have the webinar today, why it's been quite a rush for you guys, like the fast turnaround on offers is so we can recommend that 
you can apply to them if you're interested. So, great, I can see Jemima throwing in some comments there, fantastic. There's lots of work, virtual work experience opportunities that my friends who are working towards medicine or similar fields are doing. So, Kamal Preet, yeah, some people are doing more than others and other things. The main thing I would say, and this goes for all of OMS, but also even Oxbridge if you're successful as well, is it's great to see what other people are doing. It can kind of help spur you on and drive you forward. But I would say kind of don't try and judge yourself too much by what others are doing. Think about it specifically to you. Someone else could be doing loads more in one area, but absolutely nothing in another. And some people will like to say that they're kind of doing loads and loads of stuff here. And that can sometimes make you feel a bit bad. I think Oxbridge, one of one of the, the few kind of less positive things I have to say about to say it is that you can always think that there's loads of people working a ton harder than you. But actually, pretty much when you think about it, it's not the case. Like people are people that you guys are getting a place on this scheme. We know you're hardworking. We've seen that from all of your statements of motivation, which we've read every single one of. And we've seen that from your grades, everything you're put into the application. We know you're hardworking. So don't feel like everyone else is going to be working harder than you. Do the amount that makes you happy. And that goes for work experience. It goes for the OMS sessions. Just kind of keep calm with it, basically. When will you put out the reading list, says Finn? Great question, Finn. We will release them once you're being paired with your mentors and kind of as those first sessions are beginning to be scheduled. We don't release them right at the start because the main things we want you to read first are things like the syllabus, to apply to those various things I just mentioned, um, like unique and so on, and then to begin looking at that mentee booklet if you haven't had a chance to read it yet. That's all accessible through the portal on the website that you will have got when you've accepted your offer. Marie, oh, this is a this is a great question. What are the stereotypes of Oxbridge? I'd be really interested, like I could mention some that I think exist, but I'd be far more interested actually in your guys' thoughts. Maybe if we could like, list a couple in the chat in the next minute or so of what stereotypes you've heard about Oxbridge and then I can kind of try and myth bust some of them or, or let you know in in some cases if there's any truth behind them and so on. So Marie's kind of got a good one there and kind of diversity at Oxbridge. These universities aren't perfect for that okay so I'm not going to say that there's kind of a perfect diversity ratio. There's simply not. And we know that. But compared to universities, I think Oxford and Cambridge are some of the best universities to be at in terms of the places that make a difference here. Remember that every single one of our mentors, of which there are kind of over 60 this year, are all Oxford and Cambridge students or have been. These are people who are kind of completely volunteering their time to help improve that statistic. And there's there are loads and loads of people at these universities who are really passionate about this issue. So what I would say is, no, it's not perfect in terms of the diversity now, but they're definitely improving it. And it's definitely one of the places to be that you can find the people who are the most passionate about this issue. So, yeah, hopefully that kind of begins to myth bust some of that one. Hamza, I can see you've done your research. Great. 68% of state school students got into Oxbridge. Yeah, and definitely like... It's not that posh. Of course, you're always going to see articles about like this kid that went to Eton and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there are more state school students every year than private school students, of course. And there are a load of people there who will be from backgrounds and situations that will be similar to yourself. Um, so definitely it's not just full of posh people. Yeah, and it definitely, it can be viewed as very elitist. Like you see these photos of like, I'm going to call them like the Harry Potter formal dinners and people like wearing gowns and everything like that. And it can make it look elitist. The main thing I would say is like, when you're there, I think it's actually something that you can kind of like, you begin to just enjoy as part of the traditions associated with it. Like, I don't know anyone who's like, has anyone been served like a four course meal by people like wearing gloves before they go to Cambridge? Like, Definitely not. And it seems completely bonkers and it is completely bonkers. But like everyone's having it done at the same time there. And it kind of it can become a pretty fun part of the process. It can become something which you kind of 
you've worked really hard, you've looked forward to it, and you think, wow, this is pretty cool. Um, so that's one thing. It definitely can look elitist from the outside, but everyone's in the same boat there, and it kind of it can make sense in the context when you're there. And the same goes with those gowns. Like those gowns look really weird. Trust me, like I was wearing a dressing gown more than I was wearing my actual gown for most of uni. Um, so yeah, they can look weird because they're in all the formal photos, like when you start your college, when you graduate and things like that. But again, it's everyone is in the same boat there. So I, I would say when you're there, it can look a little weird from the outside, but trust it and it becomes part of the tradition that people actually enjoy. Cool, we've got some great stuff flowing in here. All everyone does is work and not have fun. Great one, Antonia. Um, what I would say here, and um, one of my favorite stats about Cambridge, I went clubbing three times a week in first year. That might not be for everyone, but yeah, I was, and I went clubbing on random days of the week. It wasn't just the weekend. I went clubbing on Tuesdays. That was Wednesday. Like you could go clubbing on a whole different variety of days. So definitely there was free time. You can also do a lot of sport if that's your interest. Music, you can get involved in like a thousand and one societies. My college had a smoothie society where like people on Sundays would just meet up and drink smoothies for an hour. So like there is definitely a lot of fun alongside the work. Of course, you do work. And I would say you will work harder than the other universities you'll apply to. There is more that, that you kind of do there in terms of the work. But there is definitely time for fun. And you, I think... Work hard, play hard is what I would say there. People procrastinate. I definitely procrastinated while I was there. Like, definitely. There were a number of times where, like, I, again, I wouldn't recommend this, but there were essays that I was definitely writing with coffee, having done uh, quite a late session finishing because I put it off because I wanted to kind of have fun or meet up with friends the night before and, and things like that. So, Students do procrastinate. Oxford students also procrastinate. The main thing is kind of trying to be as balanced as possible with it. I, I kind of, if you can not procrastinate, perfect. I definitely couldn't manage that. And like, it's part of the process. Not everyone there is perfect, far, far from it. The most people went to a grammar school. So yeah, kind of grammar school is an interesting one in that the kind of state comprehensive straight grammar divide is is kind of it's not exactly even but that is one that's changing um there are a couple of colleges that are really cool for this so mansfield college oxford last year admitted 97 or 98 percent state school students for example and there are other colleges that didn't admit anywhere near as much mansfield is kind of like definitely one of the most pro kind of like state comprehensive in terms of the admissions pool it has and in terms of where people kind of are taken but yeah what i would say is it kind of it can vary college to college it can vary on a number of things but that balance again is that there are a lot of state comprehensive school students rather than just state grammar school students who who get in Some people say that you can't have a job while studying at Oxbridge. This is a great question, Olivia. You can't. Um, Oxford and Cambridge say that you shouldn't have a job while you're studying there, but it's not It's not quite as simple as that. Basically, the reason why they do that is because they want you to focus on the studies. The studies can be pretty intensive, and when you're not studying, they don't want you to be working, they want you to be enjoying that free time. So no you can't they they will if you have a job they'll recommend you leave it and ask you to leave it and so on but you might be thinking well i need a job for the income Oxford and cambridge will help you with that so if you need a job for the income you can speak to the college department and in almost every single one of the cases i know of someone in that situation they were given a grant a free grant you'll never have to pay it back by the university to help with that income that they would have earned from the job of course, they to write that grant, we recommend that you kind of mention that the parts that you'll be spending it on are the books and the things like that for your study, rather than you're going to use it to kind of buy drinks or kind of buy a new latest fashion accessory or something like that. Um, but yeah, they can definitely help you with that and you can't have a job while you're there. Really interesting, like unique quirk of Oxford and Cambridge. If you have a joint course like maths and philosophy, will you have one interview 
on each topic? Um, great question. For those ones, yes, you can have multiple interviews and you can have multiple interviews even if you're just studying one subject and they're quite common. I would say don't worry about multiple interviews. They're so different people can gain a different impression. It could be that you're much stronger in philosophy than in maths and that will help if you have a great philosophy interview and your maths one was only so-so. They can kind of, they can help with that side. So there will be interviews in whole different kind of varieties of topics. They will always let you know in advance. So you'll get notice in November of who your interviewers are, when those interviews take place, and we'll be able to help you kind of break down how to prepare for those individual ones. Hamza uh, talking about Brampton Manor there. Yeah, Brampton Manor have had some great history with Oxbridge offers for hardworking students from state schools. I know we've probably got some students from Brampton Manor here today. We love working with Brampton Manor. Those students have worked on our program right back since when we had our first cohort in 2018. It's like a large group cohort. So welcome if you're from Brampton Manor. If you're not from Brampton Manor as well, we're hoping that we're going to make your schools just as successful so you can beat the private schools like Eton, um, like your Winchesters and so on. Uh, we definitely have a lot of fun with those statistics. And I would say our OMS program pretty much beat most of the private schools um, in terms of the amount of office we got compared to them, which is a statistic I love. And that's in large part down to your guys' hard work. Cool. Sanya says, did I go to a state school? This is a really good question. I'm actually in one of the minorities here amongst our mentors. I actually went to a private school. So in my year at private school, I, I'm quite happy to share that about 50 people got Oxford and Cambridge offers. And that was great. Like it, we all had a great time there. But what it showed me was that there was definitely advantages that you could have if you were kind of prepared thoroughly if you looked at the system. And I was really grateful to my school for giving me that. And those are all tips and advice I want to share with you guys. So some of the tips that I had at my school definitely now feature in this OMS program alongside loads of the others. We don't just have state school mentors. We have some private as well who will all help that process. And what I would say is we all work together because we're all trying to make sure that access to these universities from state school improves. So I didn't go to a state school, um, but I still think that's kind of that's helped me with a lot of ways that I can give some of the resources that I had at a private school to the OMS. Hope that helps answer your question, Sanya. And I would say that I am in actually by far the minority. Most of our student, most of our mentors did go to a state school. Cool. Yeah, a little more discussion on the jobs at Oxbridge. Safwan says, is it true you're drowned by debt by the time you leave Oxbridge? <laughs> I, I love this question. Um, but but you you do likely have to take out a student loan. Um, and what that means is it's kind of sponsored by the government to, to fund your fees. But you only start paying back your student loan once you have a full time job earning a certain amount per month. So you're definitely not kind of finishing university thinking there's this huge pile of debt that I'm never going to pay off and I need a job, otherwise I'm going to be stuffed. No, it doesn't work like that. You you will pay it off over kind of a long period of time um, so that for most people, I, I don't think people are too worried about it. What I would definitely say about Oxbridge is the average graduate starting salary, which is like one of the highest in the country, if not the highest, uh, means that I wouldn't be too hugely worried about that if you get your place. Um, you will have debt. You will have kind of money that you have to pay off because of that student loan you've taken out. But you can do that over time and only once you're earning. Great. Yeah, J Jemima, kind of the opposite balance. So I went to a private, but Jemima was, for example, state school in Sheffield. Um, and there were loads of people from similar backgrounds. One of the Jemima actually went to the same college as me. One of the lovely things I will say about Cambridge is Please don't just go there and make friends with kind of the people from your ethnic group or who were from your school or for who were from your type of school. One of the great things about these places is you can be quite pleasantly surprised, I think, by people from completely different backgrounds who you meet as well. And the same is true, hopefully, of our OMS. You might be 
in a group with someone from, a, I mean, everyone on the OMS is from a state school, but you might be someone from a completely different scenario and upbringing from you on your OMS as well. And hopefully that's something you can enjoy. Cool. Jemima trying to kind of um, be kind to the private schoolers as well. Um, yeah, I would say that that pretty much like 99% of the private schoolers I, I met as well at Cambridge were really lovely people and really friendly. Um, Cool. Yeah, shame on me, definitely Hamza. Um, cool. Quinn says, so I visited Cambridge Trinity College as part of a brilliant club program last year, and I noticed that the accommodations were quite small. Is this the same for all Cambridge College? It varies hugely, the accommodation. So it, it will vary a lot, and I and the prices vary a lot as well so what i would say is some of the smaller rooms will come with a lesser price in lots of cases so that could be something that if you really are worried about finances that you look into um if you kind of don't qualify for maximum student loans or, or bursaries and things like that um you might also have particular needs that means you really want your own ensuite bathroom and there are colleges that will have all ensuite bathrooms in first year so it, there's a huge range there. You can have much smaller rooms and you can have rooms that have their own bathroom. It's like it can be hugely varied and the accommodation varies hugely per college. I know some people who's my room in final year, for example, I got two floors, which was awesome. Like I got an upstairs and a downstairs, which I've never had before and I've never had since. Um, but I love that. And so, yeah, there are there are pretty cool things that you can get in terms of the accommodation. There are two ways that it works. Some do it by random ballot, which means that everyone's name gets picked out of the hat and then you get to pick your room based on what's available. Other ways it works is they base it on who gets the top exam scores. There's hopefully some motivation to work hard. So the people who get the highest exam scores pick their rooms first, which means you can get some pretty cool rooms. Um, there's always some rooms that go really fast, like J.R.R. Tolkien's old room, uh, writer of Lord of the Rings, his room definitely goes really fast to Oxford. Uh, you can look out the window and see supposedly the landscape for Minister if, if you look out there and get that room. So that's pretty cool. There are some pretty famous rooms that you get a chance of that definitely go really quickly. Um, some rooms are small, some rooms are big. It kind of, it varies a lot on the college. How much maintenance loan does an Oxford student usually take for four years? That's a really good question, if as, and it kind of, it varies slightly. What I would say is is kind of the best place to look on that for your college and, and, and the best places there are on the Oxford and Cambridge websites. I wouldn't want to pluck a figure off the top of my head without knowing subjects and things like that, because it might vary, but do take a look there. And if in doubt, email us and we can kind of provide you a specific answer to that one. Yeah. J Jemima was quite right there. I know we were kind of chatting about this over over uh, like last week and and chatting about this webinar and definitely having a good laugh and kind of a chill about our experience at Oxford and Cambridge too. Is it true that Oxbridge accommodation is old and very cold? Loving the rhyme there too, Sonia. Um, some of it can be old and there were definitely i actually bought this jumper that i'm wearing right now like a fleecy lining because one of my rooms was pretty cold in one year um you don't pay for heating so i definitely whacked up the heating um, and felt no guilt about doing that um sorry polar bears i guess uh, maybe that wasn't the best thing to say um but like yeah some of them can be a little cold what i would say though is Oxford and cambridge are usually pretty good about like yeah working on that and kind of maybe things like that so the, like the characterful rooms like some of the older traditional rooms will have like their unique charm i'm gonna call it like if i'm like a real estate agent like when they call it like unique charm which basically means there's like a gap by the window because the room's like built in the 1500s or something that can be pretty cool i think as well like the views are awesome from some of these old rooms and you can always buy a jumper like this pretty cheaply um, some of it is also very modern though like you can get top of the range rooms that were built in the last 10 15 years with all the features and everything like that um a fun quirk about one of my rooms at cambridge that just to prove that these universities definitely aren't perfect and can actually be pretty thick sometimes 
is if you kind of think of your usual size of an A4 file, they built shelving in 200 Cambridge rooms where like the top of the wood to the bottom of the wood was the size of an A4 file. So they didn't take into account this, the thickness of the wood at all, which meant you couldn't actually fit any A4 files in the shelving that they'd built, which I think is another great unique quirk about how Oxford and Cambridge can definitely muck up as well. And that probably wasn't checked by a physics professor, or if it was, I'm slightly concerned. Um, Karma Preet says, is it worth mentioning my EPQ in the personal statement if it's not related to the course I want to study? You can do our six paragraph structure for the personal statement will help with this. Some of them are kind of on extracurricular activities. So the fourth and fifth paragraphs are more on extracurricular activities you do. And the EPQ can be a great example of your motivation, your learning and, and so on. So that's a great one and a great way that you can mention it if it's not exactly relevant to the subject. And I can see kind of a final couple of questions coming in there. And Marie's kind of got one of the perfect questions that I think will be able to, to kind of wrap up the webinar for where we are now, which is what do we need to do now that we've had this webinar? Um, the first thing is have a good lunch, have a chill, reflect on some of the things we've said and, and so on. Um, but after that, what I would recommend is if you haven't begun exploring your mentee portal yet on the website, log in there, have a read of the syllabus. Uh, so the OMS syllabus from March through to December. Don't worry if all of it doesn't quite make sense yet. And don't worry if it looks like a lot. That syllabus is to kind of give you an overview of the whole year. We don't need you and definitely don't want or expect you to do it all in March, which is why on the left hand column, you can actually only see March right now. You can't see all the way through. So have a read of that syllabus just so you get kind of a rough idea of what you're going to be doing. Then have a read of your mentee booklet and some of the expectations in there that we expect from students. Um, and also have a read maybe if you're particularly keen about some of the interests and links that are in the back of that booklet that you can begin exploring. So those are the things that you can mainly do for OMS until your mentor introduces themselves to you next week. The other thing that I would recommend doing, that I mentioned earlier, Unique and Sutton Trust Summer Schools. Deadline is the 15th of March. Really great opportunities if you want to go up and see Oxford and Cambridge in person. Oh, and, and Jemima's kind of reminded me of one other thing. The other thing that I would, would actually recommend doing, I promise I'm not just plugging it for the sake of it. Do follow our Instagram, do follow this YouTube channel. The reason why I say that is because it will give you notifications when things are happening. So Instagram, there's lots of great posts that, that Jemima actually leads on with our great team on Instagram. So you'll see things like takeovers from students for various subjects on our stories. You'll see information that vibes on interviews. Do follow that so you can keep up to date with the latest updates. And then this YouTube channel, you'll see that we have another webinar straight away at 2 p.m. Don't worry, you don't need to join for that. That's for other students. It's gonna cover pretty much the same as this. So don't worry about joining that but you'll get updates on kind of when YouTube live webinars are going on and things like that. So you can log in there. If it's easier than logging in via your portal, it kind of saves a click. So I'd recommend the YouTube to follow that as well. Um, and do keep an eye on your emails. If you haven't done it already, please do add my email, James at Insight Outreach. Um, please do add info at Insight Outreach to your safe senders list. I know that sometimes we go into spam, um, that's because we work with quite a lot of students, which we're delighted to do, but it means that we can be thought we're kind of marketing products. I promise you we're not, we're never gonna push a product your way. Everything on this scheme is 100% free, always will be. Um, please add us to your safe senders so that you don't have to check your spam every time. And yeah, it was lovely, lovely, lovely to meet all of you. We are really excited to be working with you on this scheme and main thing is yeah have a great rest of your weekend congratulations once again for getting a place and we will be in touch soon so that you can introduce uh you can be introduced to your mentors and begin that first mentoring session so thanks very much everyone and we'll see you again shortly <laughs>